Okay, so good morning, everyone. Welcome. Thank you for joining us today for the last Wake Up With Wildlife of 2021. Can't believe this year is already almost over. Uh, my name is Kate Jarvis. I work over at Project Wildlife. So um, it seems like most of you might kind of be aware of us and know um, what we do at Project Wildlife, but just in case you're maybe not from around here or you aren't as familiar, um, we're a wildlife rehabilitation hospital. So we take in sick, injured, orphaned, wild animals all throughout San Diego. Um, so not only do we provide that second chance for wildlife, but we also are always actively trying to educate the community and kind of get everybody involved in helping out all of the animals that call San Diego home, just like us. So Wake Up With Wildlife is a series that we host on the first Saturday of every month, where we try to focus on something wildlife, conservation, environmental related. Um, and today we have a really, really special talk from Juliana Tetlau, our Director of Government Relations here at San Diego Humane Society, and Jennifer Fearing, who is the President of Fearless Advocacy. So they're gonna be going over um, kind of what they do in their role with legislation and how important that is for protecting not only wildlife, but just kind of animals in general, and maybe provide some tips and um, advice on how we can get more involved in protecting animals in that sphere. So without further ado, I will let you both take it away. Um, and then just really quickly, if anybody does have any questions throughout this presentation, feel free to pop those into the chat or message me directly, and I'll make sure we get to them at the end. So I will let you both take it away. Thank you so much for joining us today. Well, thank you so much. Juliana, did you want to get us started this morning? Certainly. Um, good morning, everybody. Thank you for joining us. Um, we'll do uh, some quick introductions of ourselves in the next few slides, but I uh, just wanted to quickly uh, note, uh, as Kate mentioned, I'm the Director of Government Relations for San Diego Humane Society, and Jennifer is our fearless advocate up in Sacramento and has been working with us for a number of years uh, to help advance um, our legislative goals and protect wildlife. Good morning. I introduce myself a little bit. Hi, everyone. Good morning. I'm Jennifer Fearing. And um, as Juliana mentioned, I have the esteemed privilege of representing San Diego Humane Society. Um, I am what they call a contract lobbyist, which is I, I run a small firm that represents nonprofits um, and do advocacy on the budget um, at regular regulatory um, advocacy and at the state capitol um, for with legislation and trying to change state laws to protect animals. But I, I also work on other a, a broader array of nonprofit and cause related advocacy in Sacramento as well. My um, roots in advocacy are within animal protection. You can see me here in my bullhorn days, um, fighting for more funding for the Sacramento County Animal Shelter, traveling the state with then Governor Brown's um, dog, Sutter Brown, the first dog of California to promote spay and neuter. Um, and I, my one big scandal that I've been involved with in my career was when the NRA, which was very angry at me for trying to um, pass legislation, which was ultimately successful to take lead out of ammunition, I um, criticized me and filed a formal complaint against me for uh, walking the governor's dog and not accepting pay for it and thereby accepting and a legal kind of gift uh, as a lobbyist. So uh, I was fun days to be on the front page of the San Francisco Chronicle being accused of scandalous free dog walking. Needless to say, I did not get in any trouble for said um, quote unquote gifts. We actually had a very miserly governor who just did not pay people for anything. So um, anyway, I'm really delighted to be with you. I just want to give you an update kind of from Sacramento on some of the amazing um, progress that was made for wildlife this year, but before moving um, on to that, I'll introduce Juliana. Good morning, everybody. Uh, once again, thank you so much for joining us today. Um, while Jennifer likes to close with her scandal, I like to open with mine. Um, I've been with uh, San Diego Humane Society for four years coming this February. Before coming in-house with the organization, I was actually also working as a contract lobbyist, and I was working with a firm uh, who was contracted by San Diego Humane to assist with the procurement of six new municipal contracts, including the city of San Diego, and exploring services um, to, to, to explore providing services to the county. 
Uh, and in my time uh, working in the city as a lobbyist and previously as a policy director for a council member, um, our local publication, the San Diego Reader, has written a number of stories about me, but this one has got to be my favorite. Um, being called a big dog lobbyist with my face superimposed over a picture of a poodle. Um, I don't know that that would be my breed identity, but you know, there you have it. Uh, <laughs> Jennifer... <laughs> Next slide. So uh, in my nearly four years with San Diego Humane Society, in addition to working with Jennifer on our policy initiatives, I've also led contract negotiations for seven new municipal contracts and renegotiations for six additional existing contracts. Uh, we are currently working on bringing a few more on board in the next uh, year or two, so stay tuned for more information on that. Um, and just as a note, in addition to my work in San Diego, I also spent uh, a decade up in Sacramento working um, in the California legislature on the assembly side uh, on policy and constituent affairs. Next slide. So at San Diego Humane Society, we're really mission driven and united by our mission to create a more humane world for people and animals. Uh, our culture of care really inspires our interactions internally and externally. And in addition to informing our core values of courage, compassion, impact, inclusion, and integrity, it guides us to promote and support an environment of mutual respect where all staff, volunteers, and guests really feel a sense of inclusion and belonging. And we really strive to foster uh, a sense of community where everyone feels empowered to share their ideas and experiences. Um, the title says it all. We have been so blessed in San Diego with Humane Champions. Uh, we've worked for over a decade uh, with legislator, legislators who have really um, taken our cause of animal welfare and the humane treatment of animals and wildlife and, and championed it personally. Um, we've got a couple of photos here. Uh, Assemblymember Marie Waldron has been particularly a uh, stellar wildlife uh, advocate for us. In fact, she was a songbird rehabilitator for a number of years uh, with our Project Wildlife uh, folks. Uh, Senate Pro Tem Tony Atkins um, has joined us for a number of years for our Walk for Animals, our Furball, uh, and just this year we honored Assemblymember Brian Mainshine, um, or, sorry, we were honored by Assemblymember Brian Mainshine as the nonprofit of the year uh, for his Assembly District. And last but not least, former assembly member, now Mayor Todd Gloria, has been a dear friend to the organization, has worked with us uh, to help um, close some loopholes and, and really provide uh, great protections for animals in our community. And he does the amazing Gloria 100 every year. He sure does. Our adoption event, Gloria 100, uh, every year he sponsors the first 100 adoptions. Uh, so those are free to members of the community um, sponsored by him. Love it. So um, just a note on advocacy and activism. There are a number of ways that you can engage on legislation. Um, from San Diego Humane's perspective, uh, well, I should say uh, there's peer-to-peer -peer protest or boycott, which leads more towards the activism side, community education, and political and legislative, which is really where we find ourselves. Um, both advocacy and activism play an important role in policy change, uh, but here at San Diego Humane, we really believe that our role remains firmly in the advocacy space. So while we may find ourselves disagreeing with traditional industry opponents and even sometimes with our own animal welfare colleagues, uh, we really believe that respectful discourse uh, ensures a seat at the table and having meaningful discussions to find common ground or areas of compromise is critical. Um, it can sometimes be pretty frustrating not to affect the change that we want to see all in one shot or right away, but really honestly, baby steps uh, oftentimes are better than no steps uh, in most cases. Jennifer, did you want to add anything to that? 
I'll just as I do it as a segue to this. Um, um, just to say some some folks are curious, you know, you have these various types of advocacy and activism and I tend to think of those as all, all appropriate across the spectrum, depending on the circumstance and on certain issues, we need to you know, include all of those tools when I think about, for example, our work to stop puppy mill sales, you know, we've got to do one to one, I mean, how many of you have tried to have personal conversations with your friends and family to encourage them to adopt instead of shopping and warning them about the perils of, you know, shopping for puppies online. So we're doing that peer to peer work, we're doing community education, you're we're probably tabling on a regular basis, if you have brochures and other things you're doing to try to broadly educate the community um, in social media and other ways. Um, but I'm, I'm not gonna lie, I've stood outside a pet store with a sign in my hand um, 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 and, been, and been happy to have been successful in helping drive away, you know, specifically drive away customers by raising concerns about what they would be contributing to. If they walked, in, walked into that store and purchased that puppy, but some of the most meaningful change then I've been able to be part of are when we do pass actual laws on the books that stop those sales from happening altogether. So it's sort of along um, the, you know, advocacy involves all of those things. Um, and, um, but as Juliana described, Ling, we're, we're focusing more today and giving you an update primarily from the California state perspective in 2021 um, and why it matters to us to be engaged in the public policy process specifically because we're all part of a movement and a cause to like increase like humane treatment of animals that includes, you know, if we want to be successful in making sure animals are protected, we're going to need laws on the books um, that um, give the law enforcement department at San Diego Humane, for example, the, the authority to hold people accountable to just some minimum standards for how animals need to be treated in the state of California. It legitimizes it, you know, I'm, I'm running through the halls of Sacramento, you know, there's, there's 2000 bills a year that get introduced and if no, there was never a bill on animal protection, it's hard to imagine like that us being a very serious enterprise or a serious um, cause. So we want to be and we belong in the discourse around, again, setting those kind of minimum standards for our society. And we uh, we we want to keep pushing those forward and advancing those um, and as, as, as an accelerated of a rate as we can in our sort of striving for that mission, that vision that Juliana shared of San Diego Humanes that shared with so many other Californians for a more, more humane California. And we also do a lot of education by introducing bills, even if sometimes we introduce something that's a little premature, like maybe the votes aren't going to be there yet, but we need to start on, um, educating folks. The news media and others um, are more likely to start shine a spotlight on some activity that's harmful to animals when there are legislators sort of proposing um, to address that in some meaningful way. So it's, it starts an important dialogue. I, I reflect back to like 2010 when and I first became aware of shark finning, which is a really horrific and cruel um, practice that, that takes the lives very cruelly of 70 to 90 million sharks a year, at least it did at that time. I'm happy to say those numbers are coming down. But where sharks were kind of hauled out of the ocean and their fins were sliced off and they were thrown back over to bleed to death or drown simply for a delicacy um, for a particular type of soup. And so we, a whole bunch of Californians had no idea that was even going on until legislation was introduced and um, we not only were able to change California law to stop that trade actually led to significant um, shifts in um, consciousness and law, law making around the globe. But so that's what we, we see this as a very important and viable way of enacting the, the vision that Juliana described. And I will click through these fast, but these are just some specific ways I, I think of that what pulls my heart of wildlife that we see in so many different circumstances that are human caused suffering, where whether they're methods of take of hunting or nuisance, um, so-called nuisance, um, um, treatment of animals or the commercialization of animals for some of their parts for sale um, in the illicit wildlife trade across the globe or incidental sort of poisoning or like mange that's associated with animals who have come into contact with super powerful rodenticides that well the rodenticides might not kill them they tax their their immunity so much that they then succumb to significant um, diseases like mange so absent laws on the books that allow us to you know 
that basically explicitly state that it's criminal or illegal to engage in these types of activities, we really probably don't have a hope of activate, activating our way or educating our way out of these um, harms to animals. So. I wanna describe shift gears. As I mentioned, I've, I've been working up in Sacramento as a lobbyist prior to the, the last seven years I've been engaged as a contract lobbyist, but for 10 years before that, I was the in-house um, lobbyist for this Humane Society of the United States. So I'm going on close to 20 years of trying to pull the levers in Sacramento to change the game for wildlife in California. I, not pleased to tell you that prior to the last, you know, 10 to 15 years, California is extremely retrograde um, with respect to laws protecting animals. Unbelievably horrific kind of hunting and trapping practices continue to be illegal. The sale of fur was lawful in California. Um, excessive amounts of take um, uh, during hunting seasons, in some cases, unlimited take. I mean, we're still chipping away at a lot of these things, but I'm I'm pleased to say that with the very consistent and persistent effort over the last two decades, we've we've dramatically improved um, the laws on the books for animals and the funding there to help ensure that there are the staff and the ability to implement and, and utilize those laws. So I just wanna make sure we're all talking about the same things because I'm gonna be describing a variety of these levers and, and in specific, but it's bills that we run through the legislature that then get signed or vetoed, but mostly signed by the governor that actually change state law advocating for funding in this annual state budget process, which means act, engaging the state legislature, the governor, the Department of Fish and Wildlife, which is the primary state agency that deals with fish and wildlife. Um, regulations, we have a fish and game commission, a five member fish and game commission I'll talk a little more about. They get to set all the rules around seasons, take limits, methods of take. Um, they get to weigh in or they get to decide whether Endangered Species Act petitions that get brought forth by members of the public with, who are concerned about the status of certain populations, certain species of animals. The Fish and Game Commission is who votes to decide whether to give those animals those protections or not. So we have to be active and engaged in that forum as well. Um, we want to chase grant funding to ensure that large projects um, that on um, which I'll talk a little bit about um, are available to support and improve habitats around the state to support um, you know, connectivity. We have fragmented habitats all over the state of California, animals dealing with climate change, trying to like move to new places that they can adjust to because of the extreme heat and drought. That's not just affecting humans. It's obviously deeply affecting our wildlife as well as they move. We need significant funding in order to make sure there are spaces that remain available for them to thrive and the biodiversity that California is known for across the globe has any chance of being available into the future or for future generations and for those animals themselves. And then Sometimes we actually have to pull the lever of going to the voters of the people, you know, the people of California through the ballot measure process, which I'll talk about, but that's yet another lever and one we are pulling actively at the moment. And then lastly, the levers include the people who are the decision makers, who gets to be the department head of the Department of Fish and Wildlife or sit on the Fish and Game Commission or on other bodies that get to help decide what these um, laws are. So who gets elected um, and who gets appointed make a big difference as well. So these are, these are we're gonna talk through some in more current context, some of these. Just so you all have a sense though, the state legislative process is a significant investment of time and energy for us to be involved in. Um, we, California has the first, that has the longest running session every year. It's a full-time legislature. They are there from January through September or October, depending on the year, with a month off in the summer. Legislators are in session Monday through Friday every week. And um, just as a fun fact, the second longest running legislative session in the country is 100 days shorter. Um, so that's just a sense of just what a professional lawmaking body, I mentioned earlier, it's not uncommon for 2000 plus bills to like move through this process, which you can see there are a variety of hurdles. I count one, a minimum of seven, sometimes eight or nine hurdles where 
bills have to move, um, you know, get a majority vote by a certain deadline um, every year in order to stay alive and have the opportunity to move towards the governor's desk to become law the following year. So it's quite a process. It's certainly navigable, and I don't intend to make it seem mysterious or um, unapproachable by the average person. A lot of citizen advocates get very skilled at helping move um, bills through the legislative process. But just to give you a sense that with San Diego Humane's kind of engagement in this process is a serious enterprise. You know, it really does require a lot of Juliana's and my time um, and the organization's sort of putting resources and capacity behind um, being thoughtful and, and taking on each of these steps and what is involved with them. Um, Juliana. Thank you. So uh, I want to take a little bit of time to talk about factors that that matter. So when San Diego Humane is considering engaging in legislation and whether that's sponsoring a bill or taking a position on a bill, um, there are many factors that come uh, into play. So the devil is always in the details, and I cannot stress that enough. Um, it is critical that we're reading in detail, all of the proposed legislation and regulatory changes word for word. Uh, something as simple as shall instead of may turns a recommend best practice into a mandate. Uh, and, and with that uh, carries different impacts for local governments and service providers. Um, and it becomes particularly impactful for shelters or uh, conservationists uh, who are already under-resourced. Um, sometimes mandates are appropriate, but they really do need to be funded. Uh, a simple wording change can also uh, ensure that the codification of important policy uh, it happens, but allows for some flexibility for implementation, which is critical as well. It should also be noted that, that policymakers and elected officials are not issue area experts in every arena in which they're proposing legislation. So they really rely on our expertise to help guide uh, the crafting of responsible policy that doesn't result in unintended consequences. And I've got one example that, that I've been using for a while because I just think it so perfectly illustrates um, this delicate balance. And uh, that is SB 313 that was introduced by one of our San Diego senators, uh, Ben Hueso in 2019. And it was titled the Circus Cruelty Prevention Act and described as a prohibition on the use of animals in circuses. So just right on the surface, it sounds fantastic. It sounds supportable. That would be something that, that we would be fully behind. But upon closer inspection of the language, the way they'd written a carve out for educational programs would have actually categorized our project wildlife programs where animal ambassadors were present as a circus. So it wasn't the author's intent at all, but without input from organizations like ours who can really inform policymakers of the practical implications of the way their language is written, the impact could have been pretty detrimental to legitimate organizations um, who are providing valuable education to members of the public. Other critical factors include cost. So can agencies who are tasked with implementing new laws actually afford to do so? Uh, lawmakers are also responsible for looking at whether proposed law changes carry with them general or other funding implications or whether there is no fiscal impact. Um, another one that, that personally uh, resonates is implementation. So implementation and enforcement are super key. There are times when laws are passed and when it comes time to implement them or enforce them, loopholes and fatal flaws are discovered. Um, San Diego Humane spent a significant amount of time closing a loophole in uh, the pet store bill uh, that banned the sale of puppies, um, cats and rabbits. Uh, because one of these loopholes was was uh, really identified well after uh, the law was passed. So it's really worthwhile to engage all stakeholders to try and catch these issues before the bill becomes a law. And then finally, history and precedent, bandwidth and capacity play really important roles when planning a legislative agenda. Um, as Jennifer mentioned uh, in the previous slide, it's quite a process and it's a significant undertaking, particularly when we're not just taking positions on bills, but really sponsoring a piece of legislation and, and taking the lead role in trying to affect that change. 
um, we always have to make sure that questions like, has something like this been proposed before? What were the arguments in support and opposition? And how receptive were lawmakers to making the issue a priority, especially in the time of COVID, are all uh, really important questions uh, and sort of background research that needs to happen pr prior to um, proposing a path forward with legislation. Amen to all of that. Um, don't worry, I am not about to explain this slide, but because we're sharing our slides later, I dropped it in, but I, you know, we have talked a bit about the legislative process, but there's also the state budget process, which is increasingly um, a tool in our toolkit to help animals um, outside the wildlife space. This year, we were super delighted that Governor Newsom and the legislature agreed to allocate $50 million um, towards the cause of helping underserved shelters around the state reach the state's long-term policy goal that no adoptable or treatable animal be euthanized. So there's going to be a great program that rolls out over the next several years where communities that I, you know, not as fortunate as San Diego's to have such a well-resourced and well-regarded and supported um, organization like San Diego Humane at the helm will be able to provide really hands-on um, assistance to those shelters along with resources to help implement um, best practices to save more um, animal lives. Um, there are $10 million as well in this year's state budget to support homeless shelters around the state that want to um, accommodate the pets, um, the companions of homeless and of other vulnerable Californians. And the lion's share of that money goes to pay veterinary bills. So we can only imagine the suffering um, that is avoided by those investments. So those are, you know, money can be very direct um, in the consequence that it has for animals. And so we are much more engaged lately in the state budget process in particular the last couple years because in a weird twist of COVID fates, um, the state has found itself with significantly more federal resources as well as higher than expected state revenues. And so we wanna be at the table to make sure that some of those excess or accept the excess funds um, are going to important projects to support wildlife and pets. So we are students and um, we navigate the, the budget process as well, which leads me to explain, So explain that for more than 15 years, I've been very focused. I've been one of the ringleaders in Sacramento of trying to expose the degree to which California has chronically underfunded fish and wildlife protection in the state. And that um, it has always been obvious that from a program standpoint, so, re so resources going in to support state biologists and scientists and others who can be on the ground really understanding what's going on, what threats our wildlife are facing and helping us identify policy and other approaches, you know, changes in the way humans engage and interact with wildlife need to happen. We just have been so underfunded with that kind of staffing and program support, as well as on the law enforcement side. We have the lowest number of wildlife officers per capita um, for any state with any, less some, anything like close to the amount of natural resources that we have in the state of California and biodiversity that we have. That led um, um, several years ago to us convincing the legislature to fund and sort of basically force the Department of Fish and Wildlife to go through what we call a service-based budget analysis. So as a rather involved year long process where they had to look at all of the things they were required to do all of the things that are part of their mission. And from a service standpoint, like identify what they were funded to deliver versus what they thought they needed. We called it like Crittertopia, like if they were fully um, fulfilling their mission, what would they be funded to do? And this chart, it's wonky, but I can't tell you how important this chart has been as an advocacy tool in the legislature and to the governor and the Department of Finance Look at what we're least invested in. I mean, we're in we're like under invested by two thirds across the board in everything Fish and Wildlife does. But species and habitat conservation, which is the bread and butter of the work that we all do and the advocacy we're doing, is only funded at a pathetic twenty six percent relative to our 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 object our um objectives. Which that's what's super interesting and telling about this. It's not just that we're underfunded relative to Juliana's or Kate's or my vision vision of what um, would be proper funding. It's relative to the laws and regulations that are already on the books. Um, like So we've committed to these ideas, as Juliana was talking about in the details. We've passed the laws. We've said these are the standards we want to have. And then we have not delivered on the funding necessary to live up to those expectations. And so 
This analysis that the, that the department did became a tool in the hands of those of us to march across the street to the Capitol and insist that we do better um, by this. And one of, I'll just say one of the other challenges of this is that we're one of the few states in the country that does not have a dedicated funding source for wildlife protection the single, single um, really dedicated funding we have are hunting and fishing licensing and tag fees, which have quite a fair number of rules on them. And it also probably won't shock you to learn, don't really generate very much money in a state like California. And actually are relatively become an increasingly smaller part of what the department's charge is in sort of serving that constituency. Um, we've given them a lot more to do on species conservation, but again, we haven't given them the tools. And so every time our general fund sort of like goes into, um, you know, into the red, it's one of the easiest things to cut um, are these funds because we are, you know, no one wants to cut our social safety net and leave, you know, children unfed. So it's been easier for politicians to make these cuts and that absent sort of dedicated funding streams to support fish and wildlife that will be there in you know in spite of those changes we're gonna you know continue to face this circumstance so I'm just sharing like we push really hard and this is just an example and of earlier this year, the governor's budget came out and despite there being significant extra resources for the state, it was kind of a pathetic, frankly, <laughs> allocation to fish and wildlife funding in, in spite of the fact that the governor had signed, you know, an executive order last fall was setting really ambitious biodiversity conservation and climate adaptation goals with respect to nature um, and wildlife. So we organized. That's what we do. And there's a lot of, um, if you were to sit and study these logos, you'd see some strange bedfellows here. This is across the stakeholder community from hunting and recreational fishing and commercial fishing to land trusts um, and then wildlife and ocean protection organizations all coming together to speak pretty loudly with a singular voice um, to say that we're not doing a good enough job on this and need much more significant investment. So I'm just giving, showing you two the, some of the tools that we use in organizing and communicating our advocacy. And I'm pleased to tell you that in the final budget that was adopted in September, we landed historic funding increases for the Department of Fish and Wildlife. And I'm just flagging a few of the things that I'm most excited about because they go towards closing that gap we saw on the far right of that, of that chart. So 31 new people. Let me just tell you, there are currently three people focused on doing um, California Endangered Species Act work. That's that in terms of the actual recovery, like what are, you know, the work that we're trying to bring these species back and create habitats for them. We have now been able to get funding to do 10X to 31 new staff positions and additional funding to do that work. In a super exciting development, $7 million has gone to create a new statewide human wildlife conflict program that's gonna promote coexistence across the state. There will be two new trained staff in every region when we're aiming for statewide consistency as well. There's been very uneven uneven kind of adoption. And, and like, if you were to have a situation of a let Project Wildlife deals with a lot where a property owner is like, that mountain lion ate my chickens. Um, and you know, that's a conflict, human wildlife of conflict situation, you know, they call up the local Department of Fish and Wildlife office. It's like chance who gets to take that call, who goes out, what they, what op offer they make to that landowner to help resolve that issue and what path that goes down deeply determines whether this is a conflict that's going to reoccur um, and cause other damage or a dead mountain lion on our hands. And what is great about this new, nothing short of a transformation is the goal of the department on this human wildlife conflict program to ensure consistency so that when that phone rings and someone goes out, it's a person whose whole job is dedicated to being trained and educated on those interactions to make sure they promote ecosystem health and work towards non-lethal um, non outcomes and protecting those landowners from future sort of, we call it depredation on the, on their pets or on their um, on their farmed animals. So very big deal. Um, I expect that we'll actually be pushing in the coming year to augment that program even further. Um, where this, these are just a few other things that I mentioned here the, um, that are as part of this um, new um, funding for the state budget. I'm pretty excited about the last one too. We've been working for years to try to take these horrible mile long drift gill nets out of the swordfish. It's the, one of the dirtiest fisheries in the country um, because uh, 
um, some of you can imagine these mile long nets that are dropped into the ocean and left and then pulled back in the what's called bycatch rate. So the, the non swordfish animals, including marine mammals and the leatherback sea turtles and others that get caught in these nets and suffer tremendously and almost all die in the process. We basically came up with a unique program a few years ago to basically buy out all those fishermen, buy out their nets, and that the funding that they're getting from that buyout helps them purchase new technology that can be utilized um, that that will catch those swordfish in a way that is um, doesn't result in so much harm and suffering for other animals. Um, one fun fact those mile long nets, there's about a there are about 80 fishermen who possess them and disposing of them is no small thing um, and was its own issue in trying to solve for this problem. And we were delighted that there is a company called Boreo in Ventura County that makes product. They basically melt down the nets and turn them into skateboards, sunglasses. They make a Jenga um, game out of it, but they basically repurpose the nets. They became an official kind of depositor, like nets can be officially surrendered to them. And they're going to roll out next year with some new product that's just the California sword fish nets being turned back into something else. So sometimes you can find these like win-win wins, right? That where you allow this industry um, to continue. Um, you take the biggest problems, um, you know, the harms that it's causing out of the way. And then you simultaneously, you know, have a, you know, stop new plastic production um, because we can repurpose those nets. So I'm excited about the increase, but it's just the beginning. Um, Another thing that we've been focused on is our poor mountain lion. California's lions in the state of California are at least threatened, possibly endangered across all of Southern California and the Central Coast. And um, two years ago, the Center for Biological Diversity and another of my clients, the Mountain Lion Foundation, petitioned to have the um, Fish and Game Commission agree to list the species in those areas as being um, threatened or endangered, which would bring with it a whole bunch of extra protections for those animals. So people, they would not be able to be um, killed under, un under all but the most kind of egregious public safety circumstances. Um, we will know in February, um, they, they, they were granted what's called candidate status. So there was enough information to warrant. They think that they will li are likely to be listed. And then what happens in the process is the department undertakes another year's worth of scientific review. And that status review is coming in February of next year, at which point we expect the Fish and Game Commission to vote to, to list um, those species. In the meantime, the department undergoing what I think over the last decade, again, has been a cultural, a real cultural shift, has worked with us to develop what a statewide, a three-step process. So basically, while the law requires that if there is what's called a depredation, so a mountain that can be demonstrated that a particular mountain lion killed a goat or took out some chickens or killed a pet, God forbid, that um, and then they're under 10 years ago or even three years ago, if a landowner said, I demand a permit to I want to kill that lion, the department has issued those. Now they are requiring three different incidents and, and basically efforts to cure the circumstance, like make, you know, secure those animals at night, build a better pen, like find other alternatives to help keep that lion um, alive. But change the you know nature of the conflict it's having with that landowner that they will not issue a permit to kill that lion until at least all of all basically efforts have been exhausted um, to stop the predation and then lastly some of you have may have seen in the news that we're moving towards building I and mean, we're going to break ground early next year in the world's largest wildlife crossing it's called the wallace annenberg wildlife crossing um, i put a little map there to situate it for you it's across highway 101 eight lanes of traffic as well as a two lane frontage road will be covered with um, California's first, you know, built infrastructure, freeway infrastructure designed exclusively for wildlife use. I'm gonna show a version from the top. This is what it will look like. It, there is this canyon, um, we, we, we are struggling, the, the mountain lions in this area are particularly struggling because they are hemmed in. You may have heard of um, P-22, who's kind of the famous um, mountain lion who lives in Griffith Park, like so amazing to think of a super predator, you know, living in such an urban environment. 
but so many mountain lions that were part of the National Park Service's study in this area have died attempting to get um, across the freeways, which they need to because their genetics um, are, are struggling. You're, they're starting to see kinked tails and other evidence that unless these animals can get, you know, bridge this distance and just by getting across the 101, if you were to look north on a map from this valley, it opens up towards the central coast. There's hundreds of miles of open space on corridors that they would be able to reach. So this um, is an exciting development that this is coming. Um, I just want to, they're, they're trying to raise an 80, total of $85 million. Caltrans is who is going to have to build this. Um, we are 86% of the way um, towards funding the project. Um, the new infrastructure um, bill has $5 million tucked into it for this. So we've even gotten federal funding support, philanthropic support, and then the state of California has chipped in close to 40 million of the um, 85 million to help make this a reality. So this is really exciting. Um, and I hope we hope it's just the first um, project because there are so many other um, places around the state of California where um, this kind of uh, wild like hot spots where there's a lot of collisions and a lot of fragmentation that's leading to um, long term long term population level harm for our critters, not to mention the individual sort of collisions, killing quite a few animals. Yeah. Juliana. Yes. So um, Jennifer's talked about some pretty uh, impressive and, and, you know, massive large scale uh, product uh, projects that we've been pursuing funding for. But we really, in our efforts to uh, be creative and think about how we can drive resources, um, uh, examine a number of avenues uh, for funding. And one is uh, a few years ago, in 2017, we worked with Assemblymember Marie Waldron. It was San Diego Humane's first sponsored uh, legislation to create a voluntary uh, tax checkoff fund. So uh, when you have your form that you're filling out each year, there is a place that you can check the box that says, yes, I would like to make a contribution. So a um, couple of years as funding built up, we are now in the process of distributing grants from Three to 20,000 um, to 45 organizations in late 2020. And another round is actually occurring right now. Um, San Diego Humane's Project Wildlife and Project Wildlife Ramona, which uh, takes care of our apex predators, uh, have both received funds last year and this year. So um, it's been an incredible um, program to allow for um, your everyday residents to contribute to conservation and wild life protection in our communities. I also, what I also love about this program is it's the sole government, even though it's a, it's passed through in the sense that we're voluntarily contributing these funds, but this is the sole government money that wildlife licensed wildlife rehabbers get across the state. So you know, Project Wildlife is a licensee, right? They have to get a license issued from the, the Department of Fish and Wildlife, but short of that license and that oversight and a requirement to submit, you know, data, um, they don't get any funding from local or state government in order for to do all of the work they do with these injured, sick, um, and orphan native wildlife. And so I think it's significant to have this fund on the books. And again, it could just be a toehold for the future of making the case that these are community based, you know, there's such a value to the to the environment and to communities by undertaking these activities or they shouldn't, they don't really belong to be explicitly privately funded, you know, efforts they're they're broadly beneficial and they deserve they deserve government support um I also mentioned earlier that there's decision makers and um, I'm, you know, representation matters and a lot of these wildlife spaces have been predominantly um, determined, you know, controlled and um, determined by, I'm just going to say, white dudes with a certain um, outlook um, on the use, you know, of wildlife for certain purposes. And a lot of the change that we're seeing is happening because Governor Jerry Brown and now Governor Gavin Newsom are wildlife conservationists themselves. Fun fact, um, Gavin Newsom's father co-founded the Mountain Lion Foundation, and one of Governor Newsom's earliest political memories was knocking on doors to solicit signatures on the Prop 117 ballot measure from 1990 that banned mountain lion sport hunting in the state of California. And so they get it. And they have, I mean, have not only appointed more women um, to these boards and more diverse um, uh, Californians, but also strictly conservation minded women and men um, who are bringing to the table and, and driving change in a way 
um, that is helping accelerate, um, you know, the, the kinds of change that we are advocating for. So it's one thing to have us sort of like begging and pleading and creating pressure campaigns that try to like force, you know, uh, uh, curmudgeons to um, go along with something. It's wholly another to have someone like us, someone who thinks like us and worries about the things we do, sitting on the other side of the dais, actually getting to pull the lever to vote, you know, yes or no, um, and be leaders in their own right. So um, I think it's also notable, there's more than just these three, these are three friends of mine, people I adore, but also notable that two of these three women are from the San Diego area. Um, also, I'll note that the current president of the Fish and Game Commission, Pete Silva, is also from San Diego. So y'all are well represented and um, I encourage folks to make, you know, connections um, with, with them because I, I with San Diego um, leaders like them are, are having a significant influence over what California writ large is doing. So looking to the future, and we're, we're going to wrap up soon and get to questions here in a minute, but um, still too soon to know what ideas will come forward. The process really is a combination of legislators and the governor and, you know, the Department of Fish and Wildlife generating ideas that often show up first in the governor's proposed budget, which will come out in January. There's often policy um, embedded in the budget. It, right because what you pay for is what you care about um so we will see some interesting things i hope in the governor's own proposals um but you'll also different advocates like san diego humane and other other environmental organizations often bring ideas to legislators things i know about um already are efforts to improve beaver protections and that's my cue to put on my new beaver hat that I'm pretty excited about i don't know if you guys can see it but it's pretty awesome um uh so I will be helping with that to improve um, beaver um, coexistence and possibly look for avenues for allowing the relocation of beavers from places where they're not wanted to places where they would help generate um, improved watershed health by landowners who want them. Um, improving connectivity and corridors, as we talked about, not only to invest in more projects around that, but more data. We have kind of a sad approach to the data collection in California. We need to get government more engaged in that process so that we make smart investments and choose the right places to build culverts and, and, and fencing and those kinds of over, um, pa overhead passages like Liberty Canyon. Um, we've been trying for years, but I think we might try again to do something legislatively to cut down on the use of bee harming pesticides, so-called neonicotinoids, let that roll off your tongue, that are extremely damaging to our pollinators, not just bees, but also um, butterflies, which has a cascading effect on all kinds of other species. And then clearly we're going to keep pushing for more money, um, uh, as I talked about earlier, both on the biodiversity and conflict reduction and also around climate resilience. Again, recognizing the migration um, that so many species will be undertaking as the temperature, um, as the climate changes and flooding and fires and other situations cause them, just like us, to seek um, new normals and new places to be. So um, lastly, I'll just give a plug because I'm working on this as well in my role as the advocate for Oceana, Ocean Conservancy and the Monterey Bay Aquarium. We are fired up about a ballot measure that will be before voters in November 2022. Close to a million voters over the last year signed petitions to put this on. We have been struggling if you follow this issue, if you care about single use plastic pollution. We've been trying desperately to get the California State Legislature to take meaningful um, action to reduce, not just the on the wayside, but the actual production of so much single use plastic. Cause like even the act of, you know, you may not know this, but plastic comes from fossil fuel production. And we're trying to get, trying to reduce that from a climate perspective and from a po local pollution standpoint, we want less single use plastic to ever be born as well as reduce um, uh, the impact that it's having on our water, land, air, and oceans. So you're going to be hearing a lot more about this. This will be a big campaign. It will be deeply fought by the plastics and, and manufacturing industries, but we hope that we can count on Project Wildlife and San Diego Humane supporters to um, consider voting yes when this measures on your ballot next fall. Moving on to the what you can do to be part of this, because it is not just about Juliana and me. <laughs> Indeed. So uh, one of the first things that I always recommend is to stay in touch with us. Um, if you are hearing about policy initiatives and wondering if, if we've taken a position, uh, reach out. I am, I am always available and I will drop my uh, contact information in the, in the chat for you as well as soon as I'm done speaking. 
um, and call on advocates when needed. So, uh, you know, we're working hard on your behalf, on behalf of wildlife, on behalf of animals, in partnership with representatives like Jennifer in Sacramento, but San Diego Humane also belongs to an animal welfare association, um, Cal Animals, that's really trying to, you know, take a, a look at statewide what's needed um, to continue having uh, California be the best we can be for animals. I highly recommend to get to know who your representatives are. They really do want to hear from you. Um, it's good to know who your elected official is, specifically your assembly member, your senator. Uh, if you need help um, figuring that out, happy to, happy to do that for you. They want to hear from the people they represent. And you can even reach out and schedule meetings on topics that are important to you. And don't be discouraged by meeting with staff. I will tell you, uh, sometimes it's uh, more beneficial, actually, to get uh, some face time with a, a legislator's staff member as they're traditionally doing the deep dives on issues and making recommendations to their bosses. Um, and, and I always want to really really hit home how important it is to remember to say thank you. Um, you know, our, our legislators tend to hear from people when they're very angry uh, and, and not necessarily uh, when folks are calling to acknowledge that they were heard and the legislators are uh, indeed and in fact representing them the way that they wish up uh, in Sacramento or even locally. So so always remember to say thank you uh, when your legislators are, are making votes that that you support and then finally, um, you can seek leadership roles, get involved in organizations, volunteer. Um, you know, there are a number of, of commissions that you can be appointed to. So, so that is uh, also a way to, to really help uh, move, the, move the ball forward for animals and wildlife and conservation in California. Totally want to recommend uh, that latter one, jump, jumping off what I mentioned about my colleagues who are now in leadership roles. I forgot another notable San Diegan, some of you may know Judy Key, who was recently appointed to be the public member of the Veterinary Medical Board. So um, lots of times our, our, we, we grow our, our knowledge and expertise through volunteer in a volunteer capacity. And then can, that is becomes very um, valuable um, for, and it makes you a very um, attractive candidate for one of these um, appointments where you will now be really in a position to shape um, state policy. So I think that moves us on to like opening up for questions and I'm just inclined to stop sharing um, so that we can see one another. And if any of you wanna turn your videos on, that's great. Um, there were a couple of questions that showed up in the chat, Julian, I don't know, you may wanna take this first one. Yes. Um, so in case anybody doesn't have the chat pulled up, I'm going to go ahead and read it. It says, along the line of human allowed or encouraged decimation of wildlife, when do you think that California will join many other cities, states, and countries that pass cat containment laws? Currently, an owner is allowed to let their cat outside, knowing full well that their cat will be attacking and killing wildlife. Research has been done, books have been written, and places around the world are moving to make that stop. When will San Diego or California? So I'm just going to be really, really frank and say there is no consensus industry wide on on this issue in particular, um, and, and it is very challenging and thinking about um, the factors that matter slide that we talked about to it is really critical to get industry together on, on, on big issues like this, if there is to be uh, any success, either locally or at the state level, you know, and I'll tell you. Um, in thinking about cat-related issues, decline. You would think that um, a, a ban on decline would be something that really everybody could get consensus around. I mean, thinking about um, you know, studies that have been done, um, it's, it's, uh, there's, there's no real argument for, for allowing that to continue, but we can't get, get our veterinary industry along with our animal welfare industry to, to even agree on that, to be able to meaningfully, meaningfully move the ball on that. So to introduce our president and CEO. Oops, sorry. That was. Sorry, that was me. I should have. <laughs> so uh, I guess that's a very long way of saying that is an incredibly complicated issue that, that there is not consensus on yet. And I think that there's still going to be uh, a, a long uh, 
very detailed discussion among industry on what's what's the right thing as far as that approach goes. Um, Jennifer, did you want to add anything to that? Adding a link, um, I think there's a lot of um, a, a lot of evidence um, to suggest. Well, a let me just say that defining a cat owner has been again one of the more perplexing kind of um, pieces of trying to legislate in this area because. Um, unlike dogs, I mean, cat, the, the behavior of cat owners and of cats is so distinct that it's very hard to hold a person accountable. We've had this in the conversation in the context of mandatory spay neuter laws as well. And things just the way that cat ownership is, is culturally sort of, um, uh, is cultural in, in, the, in the United States, I think we would find that a very tricky thing to enforce. We'd feel good about it being on the books and the policy might even be justified. Um, but in terms of practice, would it have the impact we're talking about to Juliana's point that it would be very difficult in reality to implement and hold folks accountable. I think secondly, I think there's still a lot we're learning and that's why I shared the video that I just did because um, the folks at the shelter medicine program at UC Davis in particular have done a lot of thinking about cats in the environment. Um, and I, I think that there are more cats than you can possibly can imagine that the, the ratio of the fraction of cats that are unowned fundamentally cannot be attached to an owner that are out in the environment um, it vastly exceeds those um, that are you know that sleep inside every night and then go out through a cat door um, during the day and so I think we have limited resources to expend how do we want to expend them and who you know who are the cats and what is the right role of shelters to play in getting where we all agree we want to go which is fewer cats outside, which is hard for cats and hard on wildlife, obviously, um, and less um, conflict um, that, that cats are having with our native wildlife in particular. So I think like, I would highly recommend this video as it was transformative for me to sort of follow um, um, that kind of that, that knowledge that and the evidence that they are building towards um, pushing us in some different directions about how to spend precious resources to bring those numbers down effectively. Yeah, and I'll and I'll just follow up on that um, to also mention. I, I know that we are quickly approaching uh, the end of our hour, so I just want to um, uh, offer some time to you if you have additional questions. We we are actually implementing our community cat program as well with an overall goal over time to get these outdoor free roaming unowned cats sterilized so that they're not contributing more kittens uh, into the environment and hopefully over time uh, begin to stabilize and even reduce the number of free roaming cats in, in the San Diego region. So we feel um, really hopeful uh, that we're gonna see some, some progress there. Ramey asked another question about housing. I guess, Ramey, I would just, um, I'll jump in and just say, broadly speaking, I mean, there isn't a more vexing or a concerning problem probably in California than, than housing and then also homelessness. So I think this one is is tricky um, because we we really have, there's just no doubt that we've got to accelerate the available a stock of affordable and safe housing. And frankly, Density issues, you know, there's there's a lot of good reasons to increase density in existing neighborhoods and the, and the trade-offs for wildlife that live there versus the wildlife that would be impacted by sprawling neighborhoods, you know, and building out further into wildlife um, habitat to build more housing of, a, of the single family type um, um, beyond our current footprint. There's just a lot to think about um, in the trade-offs between the options that we have going forward if we're going to continue to want and believe, put, you know, first and foremost, a desire to get California's housed and people being able to stay um, stay where they are and um, and get inside if they're not. So I am sensitive, very sensitive to the issues that you're raising here. I'm sure the folks at San Diego Humane are, but I, I guess I'll just say to your first question though about talk, you know how we deal, we never agree with every legislator or every elected on everything. Um, uh, we work to try to maintain good relationships no matter what. Um, we also seek to share um, diplomatically, you know, when we're not happy about something. And we, um, but we're not having a litmus test um, for the most part on any of these issues. And we are trying to um, um, recognize that legislators are balancing um, a lot of different priorities. And we, we just ask to be engaged. You know, we ask to have our viewpoint on things considered and heard and dealt with if there are ways to accommodate our concerns and still get to where they're going that's that's where we try to explain but we, but we kind of go in knowing that 
we'll never agree all the time. <laughs> Well, if nobody else has any questions, um, I just want to say thank you all for joining us and thank you so much to Juliana and Jennifer for being here today and sharing all of that incredible. I want a beaver hat now. I'm very jealous of your beaver hat. I'd like a link to where you got that. Um, but <laughs> thank you both so much for all of this information. And I'd also just like to extend a huge thank you from everybody at Project Wildlife when I was telling the staff and volunteers here about what you guys were going to be talking about. Um, and they were all kind of disappointed that they weren't going to be able to listen in just because they all, are all working right now. Um, but they all wanted me to say thank you so much for everything that you do. Um, as somebody who does work at the front desk and is interacting with people every single day and educating them on how to coexist with wildlife, I know education is a big part of it, but the legislation fills in so many gaps that I wouldn't even begin to give you a big enough thank you because it really does kind of capture that group of people that maybe just educating them on why coexisting is important it doesn't quite get them all the way there and so being able to say if that's not enough you know it's actually illegal to do this or you know here's all the different reasons why you could actually get fined or in serious trouble for doing something it is huge and it is enormous and the impacts of that are i mean absolutely incredible so thank you so much for everything you do for us and for all of the wildlife in san diego we really appreciate it <laughs> but if i can add close with one final thing. One is uh, I forgot and then really quickly remembered my contact information is now in the chat. So uh, please, 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 I encourage you to reach out to me anytime. I, I will make myself available to you um, for any questions or conversations you like to have. And then also, I just want to uh, return the thank you to Project Wildlife and the community engagement team. I mean, what you guys do is, is as critical, if not more so um, than, than what we're able to do uh, legislatively speaking. So um, you guys are fabulous and I am so proud to be a part of uh, this organization and, and to be able to work with you. Oh, thank you. Yes, no, as are we, it's such a team effort. Like you said, it's all baby steps and it's all one person at a time, one law at a time. So we do what we can every single day. <laughs> But yeah, thank you both. And thank you all for listening. Um, share what you learned today. Um, I'll be sure to send out the link so that you can pass it along. I know Shannon will be happy to get that link, although I'm sure you took very amazing notes. Um, and I hope you all have a wonderful rest of your Saturday and weekend, and we will see you all later. Thank you so much. <laughs>